This is the heat of fusion lab. And in this lab, what we're looking to do is measure the heat of fusion of water. How much energy does it take for a gram of an ice cube to completely melt? As we go from a solid to a liquid, we know it's an endothermic process. The ice needs energy to melt. That's why it makes our drinks colder. It takes energy from our drink. When energy flows into the ice cube, the ice cube is absorbing it, or better yet, consuming the energy in its environment because it takes the energy to make a solid who is very stable in its crystal pattern to a liquid who is unstable. It needs energy, so it takes energy from the environment, the drink or your hand, and it makes it colder. So we want to measure through calorimetry. So what I have here is what I call a NASA grade calorimeter, okay? Even though it looks like a coffee cup and a lid, it's a Grotsky, uh, or we say a NASA grade calorimeter. Because again, it looks very simple, but all it is is a very simple styrofoam and lid, and it's a NASA grade. All right, and we're gonna use special ice cubes, okay? Nothing really that special about that. And we're gonna drop them into water. So that's what we're doing here. Look at the objectives to determine the heat of fusion of water. We're looking for how many joules per gram of ice cube. Notice the per gram, notice the over the G. That's very important you get that. Who cares how many joules it takes to melt a piece of ice cube because different ice cubes are different sizes. But when we divide by the G there, joules per gram, we're gonna find the energy per gram. So obviously, if I have 10 grams of ice cube, it'll take more energy to melt than nine grams, but the joules per gram will be constant. And then we're gonna determine the accuracy results because we already know what the answer is. We know what the theoretical value has been determined by someone doing this a thousand times. We're gonna have some error, okay? So you can see, very simple, but let's talk about the process here before we get to the lab. Often enough, students want to use the heat of fusion to answer this lab question. We're trying to calculate what the heat of fusion, again, the heat of fusion is going to be the joules per gram of ice cube needed to melt. So let's write, and it's a good thing we do thermal questions to see and visualize what's happening. So we're gonna take a calorimeter, which is our styrofoam cup here and lid. We're gonna add a known amount of water. Okay, let's assume I'm gonna use 100 milliliters of water, which we know because of the density of the water, that equates to about 100 grams, and that's enough for us to go here. So I've got my mass of my water. We're gonna start with the temperature initial of the water. Okay, and you can see where we're going with this. Let's pretend the temperature initial is 20 degrees, zero Celsius. Okay, now what we're going to do is take our ice cube. Okay, and our ice cube has a certain mass. We're going to mass it out. And let's pretend, just make things easy, that it is 10 grams. Okay, so we're going to measure out our ice cube. And that's the grams I need here. All right, remember, we're going to divide by how big our ice cube here is. That's an important part. But we need to measure the energy it takes for the ice cube to melt. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop the ice cube after we measure it into the water. Yes, it's a very, very fancy but a very important classic lab. So our ice cube is going to go into our container. Now, what's happening? Well, with any type of calorimetry lab, and this is an endothermic calorimetry lab. We've done an exothermic already and that was the Cheeto lab. What do we know? We know the Q of the energy that is being released, okay, which is the water, equals the Q of the energy, that's the heat, being absorbed, which is the ice. Now in truth, on a real um, calorimetry lab, we consider what the cup is doing. The cup is also taking part in losing some energy, but we're just going to just assume that the energy transfers between the water and the ice from the one who is releasing the energy to the one who is absorbing. Now, what can we do? We cannot measure the ice directly. Think about the calorimetry of the Cheeto lab we just did. We could not measure the Cheeto directly. Well, why? Well, 
Why? Well, what's Q equal? Q is equal to mass times the specific heat, which ice does have, times change in temperature. Well, the ice is not going to have a change in temperature. Why? Because when a solid goes to a liquid in a physical change, the temperature stays constant because the kinetic energy being absorbed by the ice cube is being used to pull away into a liquid. The kinetic is converted to the potential energy. So we don't have a temperature change. No temperature change, we cannot use this formula. So we cannot directly measure the ice. But what can we do? We can measure what the water is. And if what is being released is equal to what's being absorbed because of the conservation of energy, which is actually the first law in thermodynamics, we can do this calorimetry layer. So we're going to find the joules of what the ice is absorbing by finding the joules what the water is releasing. And what do we know? Well, Q of the water is equal to the mass of the water, specific heat of the water, and change in temperature of the water. This is all of the water, right? So we already have the mass of the water, okay? The specific heat of the water in joules is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius change. And then we're going to get the temperature change of the water because after I drop the ice cube in water, the temperature is going to drop. And we'll get a temperature final, which will be lower, something lower than 20. Why? Endothermic processes make the environment's temperature drop. So we're going to solve for this value of joules, and that'll give me the joules of the water that's released. That's what we're going to assume is the amount of joules of the ice cube being absorbed. And once we get joules, we're going to divide by the gram of the ice cube, just like you did the gram of the Cheeto. Okay, even though in the Cheeto lab we were coming with kcals per gram, we had to divide by the gram of the Cheeto because different Cheetos can be different grams. And this will equal the heat of fusion, our experimental. We know in table B of our reference table, they give us a heat of fusion, and we can do a percent error. That's the lab. Very similar than the Cheeto lab, except this is an endothermic lab. Nowhere in our process are we using the heat of fusion. We're kind of come up with it. Okay. Now, would you expect our value to be above the known or under the known? Think about it. Is all the heat in my ice cube, is all the energy just going to come from the water? Is the ice cube already starting to melt after we give the grams? So when you think about all those scenarios, you can think about would we, would we be, should we be over or under our value? And that's what I want to hear about in the conclusion. Okay. And again, the conclusion is very simple. We're going to tell me what you found. And then, of course, the, um, uh, an error analysis, as we've been talking about. So let's go on and do this and understand what we're doing is collecting the information about the water. Let's go on to the experiment. So let's take the mass of the calorimeter. Now, some people can eliminate this from the lab or not. I decided to, to, to make it part of the system. I'll talk about that in a second. So we're going to hit re-zero, which we already have, and I'm going to put the cover onto the lid. This is our entire uh, styrofoam system. And you should write 5.49 for the mass of our calorimeter. So we have 100 milliliters of water, and I'm using room temperature water, so water that's sitting at room temperature, because I was using something directly from the faucet, that could be colder, right? And that would add to your errors. So you have to use room temperature water. You want the water to change only because of the ice cube, nothing else. So I'm going to add 100.0 100 milliliters of water, which becomes 100.0 milliliters grams because the density of water is one gram. Okay, so that's the volume of my water, which now equates to the grams of water. And now I'm also going to add a lid, and this is going to try to make sure that the ice cube, which I will drop in here, 
only gets its energy from the water because if I was not to have the lid, it may absorb some energy from the air. Is it a perfect scenario? No, there's always heat transfer besides that. But we're trying to limit that as much as possible. So the top of this is going to be an important lid. And now let's move to get the initial temperature of the water before we get the value of the final temperature after we drop the ice. So now we're ready to measure our initial temperature of the water. We're going to use the vernier temperature probes with Lager Pro. We certainly could use a standard Celsius thermometer to measure the uh, coldest and warmest temperature or at least the current temperature of the water. So I'm going to do so by just putting my temperature probe right into the calorimeter and look and see what the temperature is. And even if my thermometer is not calibrated, which it isn't, I would say it's probably off by a couple of degrees, we're looking for a temperature change here. Q equals MC change in T of the water. So what we're going to write down is 25.2 degrees Celsius. That is our temperature that we're starting with, or temperature initial. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, what I'm going to do at this point is take our measure our uh, ice cube and take that ice cube and drop it into the water. We usually get this set up first and then we measure the ice cube quickly and bring the ice cube into the water. The reason why we do this is because if we measure our ice cube first and let it sit for five or ten minutes, it's melted and we want to measure the energy of all the grams of ice in that phase first. So let's measure the ice cube and then we're going to drop that in. So before I drop the ice cube, I need its mass so that I can divide by the total joules we calculated to get joules per gram. So the first thing I do is take a container. I'm going to tear out its weight so that the scale thinks that's part of this uh, scale. And now I'm going to take my special ice cube, okay, and I'm going to measure its mass. And the value that we get here is 8.34 grams. Okay, that's what we're going to use to divide by our joules. Now normally we do this right before we set up the lab. So we're going to take this and now put it into our, directly into our calorimeter and measure the before and after values. Okay, so now I'm going to add in the ice cube very gently and enclose the top. So I'm going to remove the temperature probe. We already know the initial temperature. I'm going to take my just measured ice cube and I'm going to slide it in. I don't, want to, I don't want to drop this in because if I do so, I'll splash some water out. Okay, and I, if I lose some water, then I won't have the grams of water that I necessarily need. So I'll put the top on. Okay, and now we're looking for the coldest possible temperature and where you think a straw goes. And now I'm just going to hit collect on the screen. And I don't need to do this. But I'm just going to plot the temperature change and I'm looking for the lowest possible temperature. If you're working with a thermometer, uh, what happens with a thermometer is oftentimes you'll miss the coldest possible temperature because you may be talking in lab, imagine that. So while you're looking for the coldest possible temperature, obviously the ice cube is cooling the system because for it to melt, it needs energy. What you should do is swirl your cup. And by swirling your cup, you know if the ice cube, all right, is still doing what? Still in the solid phase. So I'm swirling the cup to mix it. To mix it. Notice my temperature's dropping. And I can tell because of the little bit of noise, the ice cube is still there. So again, looking for the coldest possible temperature during this process and keeping the swirl on, as we say. <laughs> Got to get your swirl on. And we'll let that sit there for a few more minutes. I'm going to run this for about 10 minutes, and that should be enough to melt my ice cube. You certainly could peek in the top, okay? But now I don't hear any sound anymore. Is my ice cube melted? I don't hear much going on. 15.1 was the coldest possible temperature. If this starts to climb from 15.1, as it's starting to do this now, now I'm getting the idea that my ice cube is completely melted. 
So 15.1 was the coldest. If it starts warming up, that means heat is entering the calorimeter. Why? Heat flows from hot to cold. So as 15.1 was my coldest. So it looks like that's going to be my end point because it, I don't see it getting any colder. And I certainly could peak. You don't want to keep peaking because you'll lose the energy. It's going to 15.3 now. Okay, so it's now it's starting to climb, which is, which is telling me that now this cold water is basically getting warmed up by the what? Heat entering the calorimeter. Okay, so this wasn't a closed system by any means. And that my ice cube is melted. And if I peer into this, okay, all right, uh, there is no more ice cube. Okay, so this has completely melted and the temperature rising verifies that. Okay, so we are done collecting data with 15.1 as our coldest. Again, you could have done this with a thermometer, but nice to do this and verify this with a um, temperature probe. So let's take a look at the data we have so far. We have the mass of our ice cube, which we'll need at the end, the mass of our styrofoam cup, which is our calorimeter, the mass of our water, which you got from the volume of the water, density of water is one, we have our initial and final temperatures. Okay, to get the change in temperature, and this is the water, of course, we're going to do that subtraction. Okay, and the joules of heat absorbed by the ice is the same energy that's lost by the water. Now, what we're going to do to make this more of an honors lab is we're going to consider all the parts of the system. What's the system? We have the water and we have the cup. Now look at my arrows. When I drop an ice cube, because melting is an endothermic process, energy must be absorbed by the water and the cup. So if I look at my two teams here, heat released, heat absorbed. Who's absorbed? The ice. I can't measure the ice directly because the ice will not have a temperature change. Who gets released the energy? Well, pretty much most of the water. Now if we kept this a Regents level lab, we'll just do the water. But really, the cup is releasing energy too. So to really make our value um, be more accurate, we're going to consider the cup as well. Now when we do this, we're going to make the assumption that the change in temperature of the cup is the same change in temperature of the water. Okay? In truth, we didn't have a thermometer there, but it's an approximation that will work. So we're going to have the Q of the water, mass of the water we have, specific heat of the water we have in table B, change in temperature we just calculated or you should calculate here. We're going to add that value because not only does the water release the energy, so does the cup. We'll take the mass of the cup, calorimeter, specific heat of the cup, okay, which I'm giving you right here. Notice the units, one point joules per gram per degree Celsius, so that will go here. And then change in temperature of the cup is the same as the water. We'll add these two values together. That'll equal the energy that the ice absorbed. Is that everything? No. Probably the ice is absorbing some energy from the air and was melting by the time I massed it and put it into the, into the cup. So once I have my Q of the ice, and this will be total joules, right? I'm going to divide that by the grams of the ice, and that's my experimental heat of fusion. I'm going to compare that to the theoretical, which is listed in table B, and then do a percent error. And that's essentially the lab. I would love for you to do the conclusion questions. And of course, I would like you to do also the questions. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the uh, conclusion as well. Tell me what you found based on your objectives and talk about the errors involved. Will our value experimentally be under the known? My guess it should be considering that there was some error, but you never know. Remember, we also have to assume that the ice was at zero. What if the ice was below zero? What if I took it right out of a, a freezer that was below zero? Look at this. If this is the phase change of a solid going to a liquid, if our ice is not at zero, it's below zero, for it to go from below zero to melt, you're going to need some energy here. So that's something to think about too when you write your conclusion. Okay? That's the lab.